Okay, I'll call this meeting to order the CMF uh, Board of Directors. Um, as uh, always, if to mute or unmute yourself uh, to uh, use star six. And as the governor has again extended the uh, opportunity for us to meet uh, uh, in video uh, format, uh, again, this meeting is also uh, recorded. And uh, as in the order, everything is to be ensured to be transparent and open meeting as possible. Meeting materials were posted a week ago. And again, a recording of this meeting will take place. Erin, call the roll. Great, thanks. Uh, Mayor Bennett? Present. Frank Beal? Present. President Brawley? Present. Mayor Darch? Present. Paul Goodrich? Present. Jim Healy? Nina Itamudia? Present. Mayor Noak? Present. President Reinbold? Present. Mayor Rotering? Present. Stephen Schaefer? Here. Carolyn Schofield? Here. Ann Sheehan? Matt Walsh? Present. Diane Williams? Present. Leanne Redden? And Dr. Kouros, I'm here. Good morning. Great. Good morning. Hi, there is a quorum, and uh, before you are the minutes of our previous meeting, I'll entertain a motion. Identify yourself in a second to approve the minutes. So moved, Reinbold. Second, no. Moved and seconded. Aaron, call the roll. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Frank Beal? Aye. President Brawley? Aye. Mayor Darch? Aye. Paul Goodrich? Aye. Jim Healy? Nina Itamudia? Aye. Mayor Noak? Aye. President Reinbold? Aye. Mayor Rotering? Aye. Stephen Schaefer? Carolyn Schofield? Aye. Ann Sheehan? Matt Walsh? Aye. Diane Williams? Aye. And the motion carries. Frank, I heard you're on vacation, so thanks for calling in wherever you are. You're, you're quite dedicated there, Phil. Under the executive director's report, uh, Aaron? Thanks so much. Um, first, let me say we have been lucky enough to have the disaster proclamation to afford us the opportunity to continue to meet virtually. However, these have been coming 30 days at a time. So as you saw, probably this last week, we were scrambling a bit, not knowing if that was going to pass to see if folks were in person. I just want to proactively share that we should plan for an April in-person meeting. Um, if the disaster proclamation does get extended, we will be afforded the opportunity to meet remotely. Um, that being said, I also am aware that there's some legislation in front of the General Assembly looking at changing some of the rules around um, um, Open Meetings Act in-person meeting requirements. Um, so, you know, if those happen to be adjusted to, we will have to talk about what makes sense for us as a board. Um, I also want to make the board aware that this week the Federal Highway Administration and the Federal Transit Administration are currently conducting a joint certification review of the region's transportation planning process. They're here in our offices uh, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, and we'll continue to talk with partners, ask us questions about our comprehensive planning, ask us about how we work with our partners and stakeholders across the region to make sure that we're advancing, you know, the transportation title requirements of metropolitan planning organizations here. Um, at the end of this, typically they'll release a report with recommendations for adjustments that we need to make, commendations on the work that we're doing, um, and we will be sure to bring that back to board members. At tomorrow's MPO meeting as well, there will be an opportunity for public comment and our partners to weigh in on, on their experience in working with us as well in the federal transportation planning process. Uh, we've had a couple of projects kick off this past month. Um, so on March 3rd, we held the second of one of our uh, scoping workshops for the Regional Transportation Vulnerability Assessment Project. Um, we have been working to really understand the lay of the land um, and what sort of information we will need and what sort of information would be helpful to our partners as they look at transportation vulnerability. Um, this will help us develop a scope, hire a consultant, and really think about how we can get prepared for some of the new programs in the infrastructure bill. These workshops are informed by a vulnerability assessment framework that's been developed by the Federal Highway Administration and 
We've been working closely with FHWA Resource Center staff as well. So attending these meetings have been transit providers, county, municipal transportation departments, emergency management department staff, stormwater management departments, um, state agencies. Um, all of the seven counties have been participating in the city of Chicago. We have also been kicking off uh, work around electric vehicle infrastructure charging as well. So recognizing that the new transportation bill has about $5 billion devoted to funding states to establish infrastructure, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and about two and a half billion dollars in competitive programs to support local electric vehicle charging development. We are really trying to understand how we can best assist the region's deployment of equitable, accessible regional charging network that can meet the needs of our residents today and into the future. So uh, late last month, we held a stakeholder forum to talk about the barriers and the potential roles that CMAP can play in this effort. Um, we've had government, business, community, academia, business come to these virtual workshops, uh, really a listening session just to sort of understand and get our arms around the size of the challenge and then think about where we can best help support the region's development in electric vehicle charging infrastructure here. So we anticipate that we'll host ongoing discussions here this next year as we, we try to plan for what the region will need. And I think thinking too, you know, the market's going to go where the market's going to go on the EV charging. So our role should be that the system is thought of as a network and that communities and places have equal opportunity to both compete for those resources and that we aren't sort of leaving people behind in terms of, um, in terms of whether or not they're in a rural area or an urban area that maybe just isn't looked at as a competitive marketplace for um, EV charging systems here. Uh, we were also notified in March by IDOT that um, the state planning funds for metropolitan planning organizations across the state, ourselves included, that IDOT will be providing the local match um, for the increase for the infrastructure bill, which is a, a welcome, um, a welcome opportunity for us and this will again support continued uh, support for the planning liaisons program that we have as well and some of the competitive programs that we award to our partners. So um, welcome news on that front. We also were able to um, get our draft budget submittal to IDOT by February 14th. We'll talk about it a little bit more at the MPO policy committee meeting tomorrow. And then I wanted to touch on some state and federal updates here that we have. So. As of today, uh, the General Assembly has passed a number of key legislative deadlines, including the third reading in the House and Senate. Um, the governor's budget proposal for FY23 does include a, a one-year freeze on the annual index increase of the motor fuel tax rate. Um, when the Rebuild Illinois program was passed in 2019, it, it doubled the, the gas tax and it also tied future annual, annual increases to, of the MFT to the rate of inflation. This is something that aligns with the 2050 plan um, to provide ongoing increases to capital expenditures and funds across our region. We have been looking at what the impacts would be should that pause go into effect here for this year. Um, the Office of Management and Budget at the state has said that you know they were estimating about 2.2 cents or $135 million, $35 million in annual revenues um, would be impacted by this pause and in the indexing of the inflation for the motor fuel tax this next year. And just some preliminary back of the envelope analysis that our team has done would show that the impact of that one year holiday compounded over time would be about $4.3 billion in lost motor fuel tax revenue statewide between FY23 and 2050. And regionally, so that's statewide $4.3 billion, regionally it would result in about $2.5 billion in lost revenue between 23 and 2050. So while $135 million one year doesn't sound like a lot of resources compounded over time, those resources allow us to build infrastructure in perpetuity and get those projects started here. So um, that would include nearly $500 million in lost revenues for municipalities and $775 million in losses to the RTA. So we continue to monitor that process of the, of the budget. That is just one area that we're paying a little bit of special attention here. I'll also note too that the CMAP RTA's transit study bill does continue to advance through the legislative process. We are working with the bill sponsors and partners on the specifics of the legislation and we'll keep the board update on, updated on the progress and next steps here. On the federal side, some bad news is that in the next few days, Congress is expected to approve an upcoming uh, continuing resolution, keeping the government funded 
into March 15th. I suppose that's kind of good news, but I think um, what we're really looking for is this longevity, like a full year's appropriations from the feds here. So early this morning, the House and the Senate appropriations finally received, released their bill text for the full year, $1.5 trillion for the 2022 funding bill. If this passes next week, it would provide uh, 102, almost $103 billion in funding to USDOT, which is $16 billion above uh, fiscal year 2021. It includes uh, about $1.5 billion in member designated projects for transportation. So I think you, we had heard about these a little while ago and folks were sort of getting projects into their members. We have received the list of projects from, um, from our delegation uh, that Illinois was in, all of the Illinois projects that were included and we can share that with you today. So should this pass, we anticipate that those congressionally, congressional directed spending, also lovingly known as earmarks, I suppose, um, what, what is included in those lists. And I think Tim can pop those into the chat for, for folks or you can email us and we can follow up with you on those. The bill does also create a new Thriving Communities program, which is a joint competitive program between USDOT and the Department of Housing and Urban Development to provide technical assistance, planning, and capacity building to rural and ur urban underserved communities in needs of improved transportation systems and to address inequities. Um, this is something that we have been talking about with our national partners. It's sort of based on the Sustainable Communities Initiative, what spurred our local technical assistance program here across the region here. Um, so we're excited to see that included. Um, hopefully next week we will see some movement on the full appropriations bill being passed. And then lastly, I just wanted to note that this year, uh, our third annual CMAP Public Service Awards program is underway. We want to recognize our extraordinary service of our colleagues in the area of good government, government on to 2050 advancement, CMAP core values, and an individual for making a difference in our region here. So nominations opened last earlier this week, I suppose, and we'll close Friday, March 25th. So if you have ideas or want to talk with us about nominating somebody, we're happy to complete the forms for you. If you can give us just a, a flag a staff down and we'd be happy to talk with you about who might be good people to recognize from your parts and good projects. So with that, that concludes my report. I'm happy to answer questions. Any comments or questions on uh, Aaron's uh, report? <clears throat> Aaron, the only comment I have to make, I, I mean, I understand the circumstances right now in the world with regarding oil prices. I just get concerned uh, with the General Assembly in passing legislation to index, uh, which we've all been asking for for many, many years, index of the gasoline tax. Uh, I just hope going forward that this isn't used as, you know, an off and on situation uh, where they politically decide to do things or not, if you want to even call it political. Uh, the the long-term effect, the numbers that you just talked about could be huge going down the road and uh, in planning long-term for budgets uh, and opportunities under Bill of Illinois or other IDOT programs. Uh, I don't know how they can plan going out if, if you know, if there's some, as we know, the General Assembly, a, a reactionary thing each year as to who may or may not want to see that uh, index uh, take place. So just, uh, you know, just a comment uh, as we, uh, as we go forward. Other comments? Yeah. All right, thanks, Erin. Under item five, under procurements and contracts, Angela. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, in front of you, I have two procurements I'm seeking your approval for. Uh, the first one is to enter into contracts with Baker Tilly, Gov HR USA, Creative Financial Staffing and LaSalle Network, in an amount not to exceed 300000 per vendor for augmented staff support services in the areas of finance, HR, the executive office, and general support. Uh, I'm also seeking approval to purchase uh, IT hardware and software using uh, contracts procured by the state of Illinois in an amount to in an amount not to exceed two hundred and fifty five thousand dollars. And if uh, with that, I'm open for questions. Questions regarding uh, that proposal on the contract. If not, I'll entertain a motion then to approve uh, the proposal. Is there a motion? Motion approved. No. Second, Healy. Moved and seconded. Again, any comments or questions regarding this? Aaron, call the roll. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Frank Beal. Aye. President Brawley. Aye. Mayor Darch. Aye. Paul Goodrich. Aye. Jim Healy. Aye. 
Nina Edamudia? Mayor Noak? Aye. Oh, Nina, was that you? Yes, I'm so sorry. I couldn't find the mute button. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Um, President Reinbold? Aye. Mayor Rotering? Aye. Stefan Schaefer? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Aye. Ann Sheehan? Matt Walsh? Yes. And Diane Williams? Yes. And the motion carries. Uh, the chair would also like to recognize Jim Healy. I don't know if he was part of the original uh, roll, roll call, but uh, uh, we recognize him as being part of this meeting. And Stefan Schaefer, too, please. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, moving on to state legislation. I believe we have Anthony. Yep, I'm here. Okay. Good morning. Go. Good morning, everyone. My name is Anthony Svalli. I'm here with the Government Affairs Group here at CMAP. Today, I'm requesting board support for a number of legislative initiatives being considered by the Illinois General Assembly that have the potential to advance recommendations from on to 2050. Every session, CMAP staff comes through all of the legislation filed in order to determine if proposals have the potential to implement these recommendations or um, recommendations from on to 2050 or the CMAP legislative agenda. Bills relating to CMAP and partners are identified and monitored, and if they advance beyond significant committee deadlines, they're analyzed to be brought before the board for approval. As Erin mentioned in her report, the Illinois General Assembly has passed a number of key deadlines, and staff continue to monitor amendments, legislation filed, and ongoing budget negotiations. The opposite chamber third reading deadline is Friday, March 25th, before the marathon session is scheduled to conclude on Friday, April 8th. This should be when they pass the budget as scheduled. In your board memo, you'll see two legislative initiatives for your approval and one for your information. One of these is to give local MFT authority to non-home rule municipalities, a longtime CMAP recommendation, as well as legislation authorizing IDOT and the tollway to use certain design build procurements for infrastructure projects. At this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions about these pieces of legislation or session. Any comments on the uh, state legislative update? Are we doing anything on Bill 30? 95, I think the number is that has to do with county build. It, I think it's identical to the uh, tollway one, only it's for counties. Um, we are monitoring and having conversations around it. Um, we focus mostly on the IDOT bill just because of our relationship with the department. Jim, is that a separate bill you're, you're saying outside of IDOT? There's a separate bill. It's almost identical. The IDOT I, I bill it just uh, is for county design build. Any reason why it was kept out of the original bill? Uh, I, 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 do, I, I do not have an answer to that. I defer to you guys. Neither do I. <laughs> well, the chair would recognize that as a part of the motion to, to uh, approve the legislation. It, it's obviously parallel or similar to what we're asking for. So, um, I would, I would ask that we then include that as part of our legislative agenda. If there's no other other questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve that. So move no. So move the Healy. The addition. Move by no. Second Healy. Any questions again? Aaron, call the roll. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Frank Beal. Aye. President Brawley. Aye. Mayor Darch. Aye. Paul Goodrich? Aye. Jim Healy? Aye. Nina Edamudia? Mayor Noak? Aye. Thanks, Aye. Steve. President Reinbold? Aye. Mayor Rotering? Aye. Stephen Schaefer? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Aye. Ann Sheehan? Matt Walsh? Aye. Diane Williams? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, keep your on that finger on that uh, button, yeah. <laughs> Just leave it open. I think we're good on voting until the end, so. All right, the motion carries. Uh, all right, under committee reports, under item seven. Great, so we wanted to get this on the agenda for this month. Our committees have not, uh, the Climate Committee and the um, Regional Economy Committee are scheduled to meet at the end of this month, but I wanted to share with you all that we have identified our staff committee liaisons for our standing committees. So Lindsay Bailey and Doug Ferguson on staff will continue to serve as liaisons for the Transportation Committee, uh, chaired by Jessica Hector-Sue. 
Um, the liaisons for the Climate Committee are Brian Daly and Jamie Jackson. The Climate Committee will be chaired by Aaron Dernbaugh from Loyola University. And the liaisons for the Regional Economy Committee are Austin Edwards and Tony Mano. And that committee is chaired by Bob Tucker from the Chicago Community Loan Fund. I don't have this title right in front of me. I think that's right. Um, so during the last two months, staff have been working to identify the members of the Climate Committee and the Regional Economy Committee, make sure that they represent a wide range of expertise in regions. Um, and so the members have been identified and are on our website. Um, the Climate Committee and the Regional Economy Committees are scheduled to meet the week of March 28th um, at 9 a.m. on March 28th for Regional Economy and Tuesday at 9 a.m., Tuesday, March 29th at 9 a.m. as well. Our first meeting is really focused on orientating uh, our members to the roles and responsibilities, bylaws, and the goals and objectives of the committees. And the committee will also receive a preview of how they will guide the agency in helping us implement the strategic vision. So our goal is to have a standing committee um, agenda report back item on this uh, committee meeting and that we would have our staff provide those that context um, and really share about the discussions that are had at these meetings moving forward. So this is a placeholder here, um, happy to answer any questions. Any questions on the uh, committees, the structures? Um, Question, Jerry, uh, will the meetings be by Zoom, Aaron, that first group of meetings? If we still have, these are still, these uh, committee, these three meetings are public bodies. So um, we are anticipating Zoom right now, um, given that we have the extension of the disaster declaration through the end of March. Got it, thanks. And, and can we get a list of all, and can we get a list of all the members on those committees? Yep, we can go ahead and send that to you. Thanks. Thank you. Certainly inform the board as to when and where those uh, or the dates and times of those meetings are in also. Absolutely. And so before this meeting, I'll also share that the coordinating committee has added the three new chairs of the Transportation, Climate, and Regional Economy Committee meeting. They talked about what their strategic actions are moving forward, approved bylaws. Um, also on that committee is uh, chaired by President Reinbold, um, Diane Williams, Stefan Schaefer, and Right. Oh, and, and President Brawley, also our members of the coordinating committee. And so um, that's sort of the connection between here and the board. But we will share meeting dates, times, and membership with everyone. Very good, thanks. Under item eight, the CMAP Mobility Recovery Initiative. There's going to be a presentation, Erin? There is a presentation here. And I'll note that because we have federal certification meetings going on right now, we've got staff in a number of different places. But um, we have a recording of this, and I am available to answer questions at the end because I've been pretty involved with both of these projects that we've got seeing next. OK. Hello. My name is Daniel Como, and I'm the project manager of CMAP's ongoing mobility recovery effort. Today, I'll provide a brief update on what we've learned since we last spoke about this project to the board in November 2021. The goal of our mobility recovery work is to overcome what we're calling the medium-term transportation challenges caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And those are is what we expect speaking? to see in the next five to 10 years once the immediate crisis has passed, but before the time horizon of onto 2050. But we wanna make sure that we're overcoming these challenges in a way that is consistent with the goals laid out in documents like ONCHA 2050, as well as other regional guiding documents like the RTA strategic plan. To do this work, we've taken a number of steps, some of which we've already completed and some of which are still underway or upcoming. We looked at innovative mobility policies from around the world. We assessed different COVID related changes to things like employment, to housing, and to travel patterns. We have looked at a number of different post-COVID transportation scenarios and used our travel models to understand how those might impact the broader regional transportation system. We're now in the middle of understanding those results and trying to evaluate what the financial implications of those shifts might be, as well as to identify what possible solutions the region might adopt in response to potential changes in transportation demand. Now today, I'm going to share some of the things that we've learned from our modeling of post-COVID transportation scenarios. This is all working toward our ultimate goal, developing a recommended list of strategies that the region can pursue 
which we hope to complete later this year in the second half of 2022. One example of what we've been looking at is telework, also known as remote work. Now we've learned a few things. First, while we don't know exactly at what level telework is going to settle, it does appear likely that it will remain at higher levels than were common before the pandemic. And so before COVID-19, we would have expected around six to 8% of regional employees who might work remotely on an average weekday. After COVID, we're now looking at a much higher figure up to about a quarter of employees, 23% on an average weekday. And there's a couple of things that I'd like to call your attention to about that. First, this is an average weekday. And so on some days of the week, like Fridays, that total might be even higher because we're factoring in the rise of so-called hybrid work, where some employees work from an office for part of the week and from home for the rest of the week. Second, if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, we have a map of the region where we've highlighted in dark blue the areas that are likely to see the highest levels of remote work. Now, downtown Chicago is one cluster, but there are also large concentrations in regional job centers in western DuPage County, in northwest Cook County, in southern Lake County, and in other places throughout the region where the types of occupations that concentrate in those areas are especially likely to allow for remote work. But even in a region that has more telework than it did before COVID-19, it's important to remember that many workers are still going to be traveling to and from work every day. On this slide, we've highlighted that most of our regional jobs, about 60%, are in fields like healthcare, transportation, and manufacturing that will allow for some, but not universal, working from home. Now, we do have a lot of jobs also in sectors like finance and professional services that will allow for significant amounts of telework, but we also have large numbers of regional employees who work in fields like accommodation and food services or retail trade, where telework is going to be a much less common option. And it's also important to keep in mind that even for occupations that allow for remote work, it's possible and seems likely that many employers and employees will be adopting the hybrid model and continuing to commute into a physical office or a physical work location for at least part of their weekly jobs. So we took this research and our work across a number of other topics like employment location, the regional transit network, when during the day people travel, where they live in the region, we used all of those findings to develop a series of different scenarios of how the region could look five to 10 years after COVID-19. We don't have time to review all of the findings from that work today, but I wanted to highlight a few of the themes that have emerged. First, when we looked at telework along with all of those other shifts, we found that the effects of our high levels of telework, so where we have a quarter of all employees working remotely on an average weekday, the effects just from telework were typically as large as all of our other shifts combined, if not even greater. So just to give one example, we can look at the total number of daily trips we expect to see from travelers in the region. Now, when we looked at trips across both personal vehicles and transit, we see a fall in the number of trips in all of our different scenarios. And on the far left-hand side, you'll see a gold bar that has about a 2% drop. And this represents the impact of just that shift to the high level of telework. That's more than 400,000 trips vanishing compared to a world with pre-COVID levels of telework, even after accounting for the greater levels of daytime trips that we would expect from people who are working from home. The other bars here represent different scenarios that we considered. Those are ones with more spread out development or denser development, ones where the region invests in additional transit service or where budget shortfalls force cuts to service. And those changes do have an impact. In some scenarios, we see a smaller drop in trips, and in others, we see a larger drop in trips. But the scale of the impacts are not at the same level as that impact purely from the shift, the increased levels of telework. However, these numbers are system-wide totals, not individual experiences. And even in a region with slightly fewer overall trips, we know that not everyone will be traveling less. Some will be traveling more, and we have to plan for their travel needs too. 
That's just as true today as it was earlier in the pandemic, when CMAP research found that our region's essential workers disproportionately came from communities of color and from communities with lower incomes. And so looking forward, we have to be mindful of similar and ongoing disparities in who has access to telework and who doesn't. Now, beyond the high level impacts of telework, there are three themes from our scenarios that we wanted to share with you today. First, these changes are going to have an impact beyond the transportation system. They're also going to lead to economic shifts, provide new opportunities for investment. Even if we do see fewer trips overall, our modeling shows that we should expect to see more trips that aren't related to the commute to and from work. Now, we don't know exactly what those trips are going to look like, but we can guess that they will be different from the kinds of trips that came before, and we'll probably see these new non-work trips coming at different times of day centered around the home with fewer trips centered around a place of work. There could be more trips within communities and neighborhoods and fewer trips to and from downtown Chicago and other large regional job centers. And so as we consider these changes, we're trying to grapple with questions like, how do we prepare for these economic shifts in terms of where people are spending their days and their time and their money? And what can we do to support active and sustainable trips so that residents can walk or bike or take transit to get a coffee or a sandwich, whether they're doing so from an office in the loop or from their homes throughout the region. We've also used our scenarios and our modeling to understand the impacts of these changes on our region's transit system. Now we know that our transit system will continue to be critical to the region's success, but we're also beginning to understand how demands on it might shift in durable ways coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. One way that we can look at that is ridership. Now we also know that transit ridership is not the only way to judge the success of our region's transit network. The transit system is also about providing access to opportunities, supporting our region's effort to reduce greenhouse gases and more. It's also clear that residents of the region rely on transit for all kinds of trips and not just commutes to and from work. But our modeling shows that transit travel in the region is particularly affected by the trends I've already mentioned relating to the rise of remote and hybrid work. An increased level of telework to that 23% high level on an average weekday contributes to a potential 10% decline in transit ridership with greater impacts on transit services like Metra that serve more of those work-oriented and downtown Chicago focused trips that are especially impacted by an increased level of telework. And we also know that the impacts of these changes will not be uniformly felt by the region's residents. Outside of our modeling, the RTA has done surveys of lapsed riders during the pandemic and has found that the people who rode transit throughout COVID and who are still riding today are more likely to be minority residents than those who stopped taking transit. And our modeling indicates that this will be true even after COVID-19 related shifts are, are more stable, where residents of our region's economically disconnected areas will be less likely to shift away from transit than are others in the region. So even more so than before, supporting our region's transit network will be critical to promoting equitable access to opportunities for all of our region's residents. Finally, I'd like to highlight some of the real opportunities that this shift toward greater levels of telework could present our region. We could see significantly reduced levels of congestion, reduced levels of air pollution, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, all coming from this increased level of telework, which is a strategy that we have supported as a region. But other changes that we are examining, like shifts in local truck congestion as e-commerce drives additional demand, changes in job or residential location could offset most or all of the gains that we might otherwise see from telework. And so as we're now going into our next phase of this project, trying to understand what should we do as a region, we're going to be looking to understand how we can make the most of the shifts that have happened while managing and mitigating 
any of the potential downsides that could otherwise occur. Now, before I end today, I wanted to share some of the feedback that we've gotten from our partners in the Transportation Equity Network when we shared a similar set of findings with them. We've been engaging with them regularly throughout this effort, and their feedback has helped us to better understand the impact that these changes could have throughout the region. First, they've highlighted the importance of starting with an understanding of what's happening today and how it varies between communities. And so when we think about things like telework, this is something where we're trying to make sure that we're cognizant of disparities and who can access that and who cannot. They've also highlighted the importance of focusing on what any changes mean for the end user of the transportation system. You know, how does it actually impact the traveler and not just thinking about the jurisdiction of ownership of which public agency has control of a particular road or asset. They've also stressed the really significant and important role that an effective transportation system can have, not just in getting people from A to B, but also in improving quality of life, thinking about issues like safety and accessibility and economic development. And then finally, reiterating a point that uh, we, we've shared before, for many communities, the status quo was broken even before COVID-19. And so while getting back to a pre-COVID normal is no easy task, it's, it's not going to be sufficient. And we have to think about what we're doing to ensure that the system that we have coming out of COVID-19 is better than the one that we had going into it. That concludes my presentation today. Thank you so much for your, your time and attention. As I mentioned, at the beginning of this presentation, we are now transitioning into the identification of potential policies and recommendations. And so we look forward to continuing to engage you, the board, on these topics in the coming months. With that, we'd be happy to answer any follow-up questions. And if you have any additional thoughts or comments, please send them to me or any other members of the project team. My contact information is included on this slide. Thank you. Well, it was a very enlightening report. I think we've all been kind of waiting to see the effect of COVID regarding the transportation system and the movement of people and how that's going to go forward. I, I, I was pretty enlightening report. Uh, questions and comments regarding that. I'll just note one thing that I thought was potentially uh, you know, significant for us to focus on here is that 60% of the jobs in our region can't be done remotely. So while we may have corridors and places where people will continue to re work remotely, when I've reached out to a number of stakeholders um, and mayors across the region about this, you know, thinking about the transportation logistics assets that we have and how important those jobs are, making sure that people have safe ways to get there is, has been top of mind for a number of folks. I've heard stories of people bicycling to warehouse and logistics facilities, which bicycles and trucks um, next to each other on the road often don't go hand in hand and are um, a challenge. So I think, again, we're looking for your insights and reactions to this um, either today or into the future. But I, I think, again, as we look to the future, it's just amazing that even working remotely, continue working from home continues to reduce the number of VFT vehicle miles traveled on our system overall. Any other comments? Any, also interesting with trucking. I mean, that continues to to, to grow, and uh, I'm, I'm picturing the future of being seeing nothing but trucks on the road instead of cars. Uh, but I think the challenge again is is environmentally and certainly uh, the efficiency of or movement of of uh, of that. Uh, uh, truck, you know, truck traffic, so to speak. And, and in fact, our last report, I think, indicated that the increase in a lot of accidents over the last uh, two years uh, from the uh, COVID pandemic has really been in the area of trucks, uh, highway and local. So interesting uh, going forward with that uh, movement. Get any other questions? Aaron, thanks. The next thing is the 2050 update. Great, we will go ahead and get this presentation started. We are in the process right now where we've been talking about the regionally significant projects and releasing those for um, review and evaluation. So why don't we go ahead and turn it over to Elizabeth and Jonathan. Good morning. My name is Jonathan Burke, your planner with CMET. 
I will be discussing the R2 2050 update. Today is an important milestone in the development of the plan update as we bring you the draft list of regionally significant projects for discussion. This list is built on months of work by CMAP staff and, and implementers to solicit, gather, and evaluate major expressway, transit, and arterial projects across the region. It is also an important benchmark as we enter a critical period for plan development. Staff is currently drafting the ONTU 2050 update. In April, we will be holding a series of roundtables to discuss key findings from the plan update and related work like mobility recovery, as well as beginning to envision the 2060 plan. In June, we'll be coming back to you to present on the plan update in preparation for releasing the draft plan for public comment over the summer. But today, as I mentioned, we are talking about regionally significant projects. One of the key parts of developing a regional plan is the identification of major transportation projects, so major that they warrant additional discussion through the regional planning process, and to ensure that there are sufficient future reasonably available revenues to implement those projects. For the 2050 update, CMAP staff used the same definition for what would be a regionally significant project as we did in ONTU 2050, and those definitions are on the screen. As you can tell, they relate to both the location of the, the new facility as well as its cost and size. In your packets, you should have received a memo outlining the process used to gather and then evaluate those regionally significant projects, as well as a draft list of those projects included in the fiscal constraint, i.e. those on the constraint list. CMAP has been working on this since the summer using the same evaluation process as used in ONTU 2050. This includes looking at how the proposed project would be meeting today's transportation needs, how the project would improve travel in 2050, and how the proposed project implements the planning priorities of ONTU 2050. As noted before, a full draft list of all those projects that were submitted to CMAP as well as those on the constraint list is included in the memo. In total, 65 projects were submitted to CMAP for consideration. This included 13 new, pro newly constrained projects, including nine arterial projects, one expressway, and one transit. These projects included I-57 at Eagle Lake Road, a new interchange in Will County, includes a Brown Line core capacity project submitted by the CTA, the Ashland Ogden Met Metro infill station submitted by CDOT, and the I-294 Tri-State uh, Expressway Bus Enhancements Project as well. As noted before, the memo includes a draft list of those fiscally constrained projects. Note that CMAP staff has already received feedback on the draft list from some partners and we're reviewing the 75th Street CIP project. That is ultimately why CMAP publishes the draft list in order to gather critical feedback in advance of the plan update and to ensure that the RSPs are meeting the needs of the region. As noted before, a key element of the regional plan is the fiscal constraint. Making sure funding resources will be available to invest in the transportation system is recommended in on to 2050, including the implementation of fiscally constrained regionally significant projects. On the screen is a chart showing the draft fiscal constraint developed by staff. There's a few key points to highlight here. The first is the draft reflects CMAP's interpretation of the federal infrastructure bill and its funding impacts on the region. So some of that is already factored in when looking at baseline revenues. The second is that while baseline revenues of about $485 billion will help meet many of our transportation needs in the future, they are insufficient to meet all of the region's needs. As with ONTU 2050, reasonably expected revenues are needed to fully fund the transportation system. This includes recommendations like replacing the state motor fuel tax with a revenue neutral road usage charge, expanding the sales tax base to include additional services, and exploring the possibility of a regional fee on TNCs. Thank you for your time this morning. Please let us know if you have any questions. So at this time, I'll share, we're not asking for any action here. This is for information. We continue to work with the project sponsors. 
One other note that we received too that we'll be amending in the project list for um, arterial projects is uh, North Lakeshore Drive. We will correct the name to be DuSowell Lakeshore Drive. Any questions for us? I have, I have one, uh, Aaron, if that's okay, Jerry. Um, on the, just, a, I guess it's more of a comment on the local parking pricing expansion um, discussion in the um, report, I think it was page six of the memo, but I, just a comment for people who have Main Street, want to see their Main Streets revived or go strong. The idea of, of uh, this was the concept of charging for public parking where it, it's been free in many places or most of it has been. I just, the caution would be, you know, the ramification for economic uh, development or keeping those communities strong um, that really rely on that as, as such an asset and such an important um, way to attract people to come shop in um, city. So uh, I, don't, I think most malls have free parking. And so anyway, just, just wanted to throw that out there. And I was, um, I had a question on page seven of that memo on this, on the TNC um, parking. And it, um, it was this last statement of, so I was on the top of page seven of 15, which was page 30 in our packet. Um, and maybe I don't understand the uh, tax on TNCs. I'm assuming that's stuff like Uber or taxis or something, okay. But it said long term, if the region pursues an integrated fair payment system across mobility providers, TNC fees should be further used to incentivize transit by reducing or eliminating fees that link TNC rides and transit trips. Now, maybe this isn't the place to explain that, or I'm just a dummy, um, but I was confused by that concept. So maybe this is an offline, I don't know. Or, I think I can respond to that um, fairly quickly here. I think one of the things that we have been looking at as we look to how do you pay for your transportation fees and transit fees collectively moving forward, perhaps you only think about needing to spend $100 on your transit trips, and that could include a bike rental, a taxi or an Uber or Lyft, or your, your you know, CTA Metro or Pace card is sort of the concept here. But one of the things we don't want to see is, and that I think we have seen is that with all of the Ubers and Lyfts, in, in many cases, we've seen that some of those trips cannibalize from transit, right? They're going so, very similar places that transit are going. So the thought there would be to incentivize people to connect to transit and take transit because it's already sort of a, a built asset that we're paying for. Um, and therefore you would reduce some of those uh, additional fees if you were to, to incentivize people to utilize transit. Got it. Okay, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Other questions? Other business? Meetings open to the public. Erin, do we have anybody online? So I have yeah. Oh, thank you. Hi, Garland. How you doing, Erin? Um, I just wanted to say um, that was a great presentation. And also, too, when you get a chance to make sure when you have the new ADA transition, tell them to make sure for the climate and make sure to put that in the presentation for, for them so that they'll understand what is what so that the disability community will know what is what, what's going on so that they can so they can have a clear understanding because it's sometimes there's always complications. So like communicate with them, even though some of them can't speak in, in and have to translate in other languages too, to make sure that they'll really how to be extremely well prepared for this one, because they, they just don't under, they just really don't understand it. It's like two sides of it. So make sure to give them a clear, comprehensive understanding of this and then they'll be extremely well prepared for it. Thanks, Garland. And I, I'll share with the board and with you that we have um, hired an ADA director for the program that will be kicking off. Um, she will start next month. And perhaps Garland, I'll offer that we can connect her with you to, to talk a little bit about your experience here in the Chicago region and get that. Okay, me and my wife, um, me and my wife will, will explain to them about what we did and everything. Thank you so much, Garland. All right. Thanks, Garland. <clears throat> Any other comments? 
I have not received anything else. Um, if there is anyone on the phone that needs to hit star six and unmute themselves for public comment, um, give it a pause for a second here. Hearing none, I, I don't think we have any other public comments. Okay. As Aaron indicated in the beginning of the meeting, we, we are not sure whether the extension of the executive order to allow virtual meetings will take place before our next meeting. So the, again, the assumption is that we may meet in person for the first time in, in years, it seems like, and also to finally get a uh, opportunity to view the new headquarters if, if that takes place. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we will keep you notified Again, this the last executive order was right at the beginning of the month, which really only gives a couple of weeks to prepare either way, but we can do it either way and we'll find that out. Uh, those on the executive committee, uh, we will meet immediately after this uh, this Zoom call. And uh, Aaron, anything else? Nothing else on my end. All right. <clears throat> Moved along quite quickly. Thank you. And uh, with that in mind, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved, Darge. Second, Rotaring. Aaron, call the roll. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Frank Beal. Aye. President Brawley. Aye. Mayor Darge. Yes. Paul Goodrich. Aye. Jim Healy. Aye. Nina Edamudia. Aye. Mayor Noak. Aye. President Reinbold. Aye. Mayor Rotaring. Aye. Stephen Schaefer. Aye. Carolyn Schofield. Aye. Ann Sheehan, Matt Walsh, and Diane Williams. Aye. The motion carries. Everybody have a great day and we'll uh, maybe see each other in person next month. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. You take care, everybody.